Hello, 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 welcome. My name is Katherine Hecht. I'm the executive director of the Alexander Valley Film Society and I'm your host for Focus On. And today we have the incredible, the one and only film critic Jan Wall, who's gonna be in the studio with us today. And we're going to talk about Jan a lot, but we're also gonna talk about my favorite year. So I hope you had a chance to watch that before we get together today. So uh, housekeeping. We have the sixth annual Alexander Valley Film Festival coming up. We open up September 23rd. We're running through September 27th. So that's a week from Wednesday to Sunday. We have passes on sale. We have individual tickets. We have some incredible pickup dinners for you to stay connected with the community during the festival. And it is a true invitation for you to just take five days, one day, however you can and as often as you can to retreat with us into the world of film, food and wine, and intensely wonderful conversation. We have so many great panelists lined up. And right now, more than ever, it's just time to stay connected and talk about great things that we love like art and movies. Uh, so with that, I'm so excited to welcome into the studio, Jan. We uh, were talking so passionately that uh, I almost forgot to start the show. So without further ado, hi, Jan, welcome. Hi, Catherine, hi everybody. <laughs> Fellow film lovers. Yes, so good. Welcome, welcome. It is, Thank what a you. treat for us to have you here. It's a great and time right now to celebrate movies, to, to find our smiles with great film, to remember that cinema can save us even in the worst of times. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks. That's amazing. And so you are dialing in today from Marin, right? Yes. We're in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how, um, here we are in the middle of this pandemic. Right. Tell us first how you're doing. I'm doing fine. I mean, I feel very bad for everybody. My sister lives in Oregon. So of course my heart goes to those people who are so affected by the fires. We're affected by the fires. Uh, you know, we've got everything from global warming to politics going on. So this is a very rough time. Yeah. I myself am doing really fine. I'm sorry to say, I feel a little guilty, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's because people are hungry uh, mm -hmm. to get their minds off it, to find a respite, even if it's just an hour and a half film, to just find some way uh, to either laugh or remember to, to, you know, that there are good things out there and just get away, escape. Uh, you know, we need to do it. We're going to go quite mad otherwise. So it's important <laughs> this time. It's important this time to to uh, look at movies and TV shows and things that really make you feel better and take you into a positive place, if only temporarily. Jan, were there other times that you can remember where movies were an anchor like they are right now for you? Well, not like they are right now, but I mean, they've always been an anchor for for me. I grew up loving the movies. I grew up uh, both on camera and off camera around the movies. So I was very lucky. And uh, I remember if, uh, you know, if, if, if things were not good, maybe we'd put on Some Like It Hot, you know, the uh, <laughs> yeah. great Billy Wilder film. Yeah. Uh, you can't take it with you. This wonderful yeah. friend, you know, not put it on because there wasn't video back then, but there'd always be some old movie on the old Packard Bell TV set. And my parents loved movies and really believed that they took you into a better place, you know, and that you had to find yourself in the movies and that all of life's questions are answered in the movies. For example, Auntie Maine was uh, with Rosalind Russell, not the bad remake, not the bad <laughs> poor Jerry Herman movie. Forget it. Auntie Mame with Rosalind Russell was a huge thing for me because it reminded me of my own mother and I could find myself in the character, the eccentric, wild Auntie Mame so, and still do find myself in that character. So, uh, you know, uh, Mae West, my personal role model, oh, I love her. And so uh, <laughs> she was very important to me and would cheer me up in these times or else I'd go on a journey, a film journey. And this is what I recommend to people now. I do a whole talk on going, you know, we can't travel right now. And mm -hmm. I'm a huge traveler, I'm a world traveler. And uh, I do a whole talk on places to go through the movies. So can you tell us more about your mom? Wait, first of all, tell us where you were born. 
Okay. I was born in West Los Angeles, St. John's Hospital, uh, and mm -hmm. then lots of movie stars around. And then uh, we were I was raised around swimming pools and movie stars, um, <laughs> a street called Hutton Drive in Beverly Hills, and then um, Malcolm Avenue in Westwood. And there were huge stars everywhere. I mean, and all my friends' parents worked in the industry. So I pretty uh. much grew up going to movie sets and uh, watching that. But my parents loved movies. There were a couple of Midwest kids that came to West LA and made good. And uh, my mom would take, my mom loves scandals, Hollywood scandals. And I do a whole <laughs> talk on Hollywood scandals. I'm crazy for them. I'm kind of an expert in Hollywood scandals. And so I really, I would say that it's not sounding, I don't mean to sound uh, egocentric, but no. I really know a lot about that subject. And so um, Anyway, my mom would take us around to all these houses. Oh, that's where that happened. And that's where this happened. And then, uh, you know, that's where he committed suicide. That's where they got divorced. That's where, you know, he was shot. You know, I mean, just great stuff like that all over L.A. And then also my my father loved Errol Flynn. And so anytime there was an Errol Flynn movie on or and my mom loved all the strong women in movies, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Ross Russell and Irene Dunn and all these strong women. So anytime there's a strong woman in the movies she loved that too oh. yeah so i grew up uh but you'd see you know i grew up with a lot of famous people i mean my temple had so many famous people at it sinai temple in west la that nobody faced the rabbi they they faced the door to see who was coming in <laughs> and there you have it judaism la style <laughs> But there are a lot of famous people, you know, yeah. like G. Robinson and Don Rickles and Michael Landon and on and on. Don Rickles. Oh, my God. Yeah. Very religious. Very religious. Yeah. Wow. I mean, so, it, it wasn't that religious of a place, but he was he was one of the more religious ones. And then so were you you were in Hollywood and then where yeah, what was West your LA. I call it West L.A. Uh -huh. West L.A. OK. Yeah. yeah. So, but, uh, Hollywood was right there. I mean, it's part of it. Hollywood. Pacific Palisades, Beverly Hills, Westwood, Brentwood, that whole Santa Monica, that whole area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then where 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 was your next move? Where did you go next? Oh, right. Well, uh, the day I graduated high school, I was already in the business because there was a wonderful man who owned uh, KTLA, and he put me on a TV show. I was one of four kids chosen to go on this TV show when I was in high school called wow. Youth and the Police. And it was, uh, it was just, uh, we would, we would question uh, people in authority, like the mayor, the sheriff, the owner <laughs> of McDonald's, you know, Ray that started McDonald's, you know, all this stuff. We'd be, so every week I was on TV and I mean, I was already in the business, but I knew I wanted to stay in television because uh, movies were too slow. You know, I'd been on sets long enough to know that they go too slow. It takes forever to do a setup and a shot. And oy. so I like television because it moved quick. Yeah. And yeah. So also I like critical thinking because my parents mm -hmm. raised us to be critical thinkers. And my friend John Leguizamo just did a TV, uh, by the way, a movie everybody should see. He's it's a friend in our of mine. Festival. And it's going to be in our festival. You're kidding. No. It's called Critical Thinking. Yes. Everybody must see it, Catherine. You will it's love so it. First of all, it has an incredible ending. So you leave feeling better about the world than when you started. And my God, do we need that now? Yes. And it's just a, a wonderful film. And anyway, a, a critical thinking is something I was raised with. And mm -hmm. so um, my parents taught it to us. And so I've always been a, a writer, a kind of a critic, uh, even though I got in the business, you know, first as being on camera, but then I really preferred being an associate director. And mm -hmm. I became the only associate, the only female associate director at a, at a network, the second one ever at a network. And uh, that was an ADSM, Associate Director Stage Manager, which put me in the Directors Guild in 1977. One of the youngest women to ever be in the Directors Guild, which I'm still in. And, um, you know, I just, and I, I produce documentaries. I've always been a uh, strong yeah. feminist uh, woman, you know, and I produced two documentaries, uh, also in the 70s, uh, early 80s that won Emmys. And I don't know, I seemed like I've, I've just been passionate on this for a long time. Well, you have. And so we were talking before. I just wore myself out talking about it. So, <laughs> ah, God, I feel a lot. Yes. Yeah, take a breath, take a breath. Um, oh my gosh, what are you drinking? 
Um, this is this energy, um, not energy. It's, oh, what's it called? Gatorade that has no sugar in it. Oh, okay. It is. Yeah, Gatorade with no sugar. <laughs> it's kind of crappy, but, you know, it does the job. <laughs> you got to stay hydrated <laughs> right now with all that smoke out there. Hey, what, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, more than you, more than we think. Um, right. Okay, so wait, I want to go back because we were talking before we went live about all the different outlets that you um, contribute to and you have shows on. And then um, do, can you, do you mind giving me just that kind of a rundown of that again? And then I want to talk about the um, armed service, the armed forces. Oh, that. One. Oh, yes. Oh, well. Uh... <laughs> so two columns. Okay. I sort of wake up thinking about, you know, uh, old movies and classic Hollywood. I kind of wake up. I mean, it's in my blood. I bleed celluloid. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, my girlfriend and I have a girlfriend who's a drag queen, and she says she bleeds ble bleeds um, sequins, and I bleed <laughs> celluloid. Anyway, um, the um, uh, I'm on uh, KGO Radio, which is mm -hmm. eight ten a.m. every Saturday night for a half hour at seven thirty mm -hmm. with the great John Rothman. Uh, I I do two columns a week. One is for the San Francisco Bay Times. Uh, which is a LBGTQ paper in the city. And then I'm also, I write for the Marin Jewish Community Center every week. And it's a really good column. I'm really proud of it. I uh, just got told Marin Magazine is doing a piece on me uh, that I wrote for them on food and nice. movies uh, next oh, month. Good. So there'll be, if you look in the October issue of Marin Magazine, you'll see some stuff on me. And I mean, by me. And um, anyway, uh, the arm, you want me to go right into the armed services thing, Catherine? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think well, that's so I also do a thing on Fridays uh, for the armed services radio network, and it goes all over the world, and it's an hour show, and we do three guests. We just had John Leguizamo on to talk about uh, critical thinking, so I'm glad, really glad that's part of your festival. Yeah. Um, it's such a good film. It's very much like Stand and Deliver, but yes. it's different. Yes. It's yeah. different, but remember that film about the teachers mm -hmm. and the importance of teachers? Mm -hmm. It's like that. But it's even, yeah. it's it's different, but it's still a true story. And at mm -hmm. the end, you get to meet the real guys. But anyway, yeah. so this is Armed Forces Radio, and I, I help produce it, and I, I, I'm on it. And uh, I interview three people a week on that. And it's film-related, and television related because I like to talk about great TV too. I mean, right now there's a lot of great TV. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Between Netflix and YouTube. Don't forget yeah. YouTube has everything. Just this morning, I was feeling a little bit of the blues since I watched the news. And so I was, um, I don't stop watching the news because I'm an old journalist. You know, I spent years working in journalism and, you know, I, uh, so anyway, so, um, I mean, and news. So I watch news. So anyway, so I got sad after that. And so then I put on the best of Mel Brooks on YouTube. Man, did I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, know, so we watched, uh, uh, my husband Ryan and I rewatched My Favorite Year last night in preparation oh, for it. Great. And, uh, and we asked Love our viewers too. Yeah, we said, hey, give this a rewatch. We're going to talk to Jan Wall about this. And my husband insisted that we get Chinese food. <laughs> Good. There's a sequence said, in the movie about Chinese food. Yeah. Yeah. He said, yeah. we can't watch this movie without Chinese food. So, right. um, what, so when you, so let's talk a little bit about my favorite year because oh, I, I talk what, all day about that film. Mel Brooks and Neil Simon, and there's right. so much, it's, it's so woven in there. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the deal yeah. about my favorite year. A lot of people don't know it's a true story. It's based on a true story. And that's the thing to remember about this film that's so brilliant is it's based on what happened when Mel Brooks was working for the Sid Caesar Comedy Hour, right? Big show, huge show. I'm trying to think of something that's similar to it. It would be like, I mean, like the Ed Sullivan show, if you remember, if anybody's old enough to remember that or any of these old variety, Carol Burnett, that's yeah. how big uh, the, your show of shows was, right? Sid Caesar. Mm -hmm. so he's worked, Mel Brooks is one of the comedy writers. 
And they and somehow the show books Errol Flynn, the huge swashbuckler <laughs> actor who's so great. If you watch Robin Hood or Gentleman Jim or any number of Errol Flynn movies when he was at his best before he became dissipated. Um, I mean, when I was a little girl, it was so wonderful because we'd go to the Cock and Bull restaurant on Sunset Strip. My dad loved Flynn. By that time, he was already an old drunk. But um, my dad would walk in and there was all these British actors there because they love Cock and Bull because it was a British kind of a pub on the strip, on Sunset Strip. And there'd be, you know, David Niven and Peter Lawford and all these guys. And then right in the middle would be Earl Flynn falling off his bar stool. And my dad would always say, hey, look, there's Earl Flynn falling off his bar stool. But it's okay, because he was still great. So back to my favorite years. So Errol Flynn gets booked on the Sid Caesar Comedy Hour. Now that's a big star. It's a big mm -hmm. get, what we call in the business, a big get for the show. But the trouble was he was already on the downside. He was sliding down and uh, through a river of, uh, of alcohol. And he owed the IRS a whole lot of money. And that is why he took the job on the Sid Caesar Comedy Hour. And that is why uh, this movie was done like this. It's a true story. And I didn't so know they that. built it all around that of what happened when and so Errol Flynn they chose the perfect person to play him which was Peter O'Toole they had a bunch of what we call b-roll right what they could use in the film of Peter O'Toole and Lord Jim they use Lord Jim they use any number of uh movies that, P that Peter O'Toole made when he was swashbuckling so yeah. he could be you know they could use that and, uh, you know, he understood dissipation because Peter O'Toole, as we know, is an alcoholic himself. So mm -hmm. it, uh, decadent and debauched. Don't you love <laughs> debauched? So that was uh, that was definitely uh, part of this. So many other things in that film is great. Like, for example, Joe Bologna as Sid Caesar. King Kaiser so is the name of the character, right? And Joe Bologna is brilliant. Uh, he studied, uh, I got to, I've talked to everybody regarding this movie. I'm kind of good at this movie because I love it so much. <laughs> I really love this film. Yeah. And uh, he said that uh, he studied Sid Caesar and, you know, uh, um, it, it's just brilliant. I wrote down one thing I wanted to be sure I said that um, Cameron Mitchell, oh yeah, Cameron Mitchell, who plays oh, yeah. uh, the boss, you know, boss, uh, boss Rojak said he studied Jimmy Hoffa. <laughs> to get that right. So all these Definitely. characters are based on real people. Plus yeah. a lot of them are just showbiz greats like Selma Diamond, who plays the costume designer. I worked uh, for a year uh, for, when I worked at ABC as an AD, uh, a, a associate director, stage manager, I worked with some huge names. And one of the shows I worked on was the Lawrence Welk show. And let me tell you, there was a woman who was a costume designer who was just like that character that Selma Diamond plays in my favorite year. So everything feels real. Plus, the yeah. director, um, Richard, uh, um, oh, wonderful, uh, 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 what is wrong with me? Uh, you know, the director uh, of the film, he was a page at 30 Rock. So when you see yes. the environment and what 30 Rock was like, he was a page there. I'll get Richard it. Benjamin. What? Yes, yes. Richard Thank Benjamin, you. yes. Thank you, Catherine. You were in the stove, the refrigerator, and the free trip to Encino. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Richard Benjamin, who I've interviewed a lot, and he's wonderful, and he has this long marriage to Paula Prentice. Anyway, he said... He was so excited. This is his first movie as a director. And uh -huh. he, um, you know, he was extremely excited to be working with, you know, Peter O'Toole and all these great character actors, you know, and uh, it's just a wonderful film. And is that when Mark Lynn mm. Baker, did he just kind of arrive in that movie? Arrive, yeah. He had to audition because he was unknown. So he yeah. auditioned a lot. And they finally chose him because he was so right, you know, real Jewishy, nebishy, you know, after the girl that he, after the shiksa. I mean, there's all these things that really work for that character. And, uh, you know, Richard Benjamin, the director, came out of comedy himself. And you could see him yeah. in a lot of movies. If you look it yeah. up, you could see him as a comic character. And uh, like Goodbye Columbus and so many others. And so he understands comic timing. There's some real genius comic editing and comic timing in this. And uh, also, um, it, this, it's just funny ethnic humor, you know, when he finally goes to Benjamin Stone's house and he meets everybody. And it's hysterical. I mean, you can watch it over and over. Did you find yourself laughing out loud? You and your oh, my husband? God. 
Oh my God, yes. And then we even pulled up some of the Broadway tunes. Did you see the show on Broadway? Oh, it was a Broadway musical, yeah. Um, <laughs> Kazan was the only person who took went from the movie to uh, the Broadway musical, but uh, Lainey Kazan. But oh. uh, otherwise, it was all new people and new tunes yeah. and all that. I never did see the Broadway musical. I have a tendency, this is just my own thing, that... I keep things pure in my head if I can. And this movie is, so, I mean, and I'm a big musical girl, believe me, I could do a whole talk on musicals, but I teach classes on musicals, but um, I, I sort of leave this alone. This is pure, pure treasure to me, the movie. Mm. Yeah, uh, Jan, so this is kind of, uh, we just had a question come in. This is actually mm -hmm. one of our board members, uh, mm -hmm. Hillary Moore, who's in Healdsburg. She says, I believe Hi, classic Hillary. cinema too. Let's hear some gossip. <laughs> okay. She likes, what is she, she said? She says, I believe classic cinema too. Okay. She okay, believes well, something like too. What kind of gossip would you like? I mean, there's everything. There's wonderful, uh, oh, there's everything. There's Mary Astor's diary, wonderful Mary Astor who kept a diary about her lover. And her, her husband found it, went to court, big thing. Be, uh, she ended up still being more popular than ever in movies like The Maltese Falcon. Uh, and then there's Robert Mitchum going to prison for uh, uh, a month because he uh, was caught in the marijuana in those days, in the 50s. Ends up more popular than ever when he gets out of prison. William Desmond Taylor, who they never did solve in the 1920s. It was a shooting. Never did solve it. And uh, and uh, it was probably the mother of one of his lovers who happened to be, oh yeah, 15, Mary Miles Minter, who was a big star at the time. And my favorite, one of my favorites is, has it been made into a movie? There's two of my, two of my favorites have been made into movies I would really recommend. I could do a whole thing about movies about scandals, but one of them is called um, uh, The Cat's Meow. It's Peter Bogdanovich. And it's about uh -huh. the killing of uh, Thomas Ince on William Randolph Hearst's boat because he thought he was Charlie Chaplin. Hearst allegedly killed him, killed Ince, who was a huge producer like Spielberg, because um, he thought he was having an affair with Marion Davies. And then uh, the other one is called Holly Woodland, truly a great film about poor, poor Reeves, uh, who thought that uh, he thought uh, he played Superman on television and mm -hmm. George Reeves, and he, uh, they, his suicide was not a suicide, it was a murder, and he was having an affair with the wrong woman. Mm. Uh, yeah, and it was a murder, definitely. Now they come out and say it many, many years later, but my mom used to drive us past that house on, Bre on uh, Benedict Canyon and say, that's it, that's a place where he was murdered. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. wasn't a suicide, he was murdered. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what about celebrity today? What I mean, what do you think about all that? I mean, do you still, do you feel like it's changed since when you were a kid? I interview a lot of today's celebrities and they're the most boring people you could ever meet. So boring. <laughs> I mean, they don't know anything. They don't have individual personalities. They're only about promoting their product. Uh, mm -hmm. They don't have a sense of classic Hollywood. Uh, so many of the women look alike. It's sad. It's really sad how many of the women look alike. And then you have some really great people. You know, you got your Sally Field, your Meryl Streep, your Jodie Foster. You know, you get these great people. And then, uh, but unfortunately, I also have to interview the dregs uh, who are overpaid and way overpraised. <laughs> Did I answer your question? <laughs> Do you have a um, do you have a favorite uh, what tell, what's your favorite film out right now or recently that you saw that you're just mad for? Oh, I just love uh, hmm. well the one I said by Do John Leguizamo that you're going to have. Uh, yeah, but also uh, I really like some of what Netflix is doing and the, mm. the series Hollywood was a very mm -hmm. good series. Uh, it upset people because it had graphic sexuality. <laughs> you know, pull on your big boy and big girl pants, folks, because it is yeah. a good ride. It's half imagination and half reality. A lot of good scandal in that one. But it's called Hollywood, uh, and I thought it was very well done by Netflix. Uh, yeah. I'm very interested in Russian history. They also did a really good one recently called The Romanovs uh, uh -huh. about uh, Nicholas II and Alexandra. So there's a lot of interesting things out there. And, of course, Turner Classics. I mean, you just have to know mm. where to look. And I can help guide you because that's what I do. You know, I mean, 
uh, there's a lot of good things out there right now. You know, there's new shows out there all the time. And then I go and back and um, one of my favorite TV shows ever made was called Northern Exposure. It was about Alaska. Oh, my God. I, do you like it, Catherine? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh -huh. I watched an episode on YouTube a couple of days ago and I thought, geez, I love this. Yeah. Love so this. it was so it was so refreshing. Yeah. And it had eccentric characters and they yep. were all different ages. So mm -hmm. that's very similar to a movie, uh, you know, that, you know, it's great when they have different ages in a film like Moonstruck. You know, Moonstruck is has many love stories going on of different ages. I mean, there's a main one, but then there's all these side ones. Huh. I like that. What's the point? Are you a fan of The Crown? Oh, God, yes, of course. Who wouldn't be? And I like best Helena Bonham Carter. God, my hat's getting in the way. Helena Bonham Carter does uh, really good as Princess Margaret. But everybody's good. The costumes are great. You know, even if you've seen something, see it again and see the costumes and the editing and the sets. You know, yeah. it's a musical. We see the dancing, you know. I mean, you know, it's amazing what YouTube can bring you. That's amazing. Have you tried getting on YouTube, Catherine, and seeing all the great things you can find? I, yeah, I mean, I, you're encouraging me to go deeper. I, oh, I feel yeah. Like, and yeah. it can be anything you're in the mood for. Like, I have a big crush on Hugh Jackman, right? So the <laughs> other day, I said Hugh Jackman in Oklahoma, which was a TV special. And I got Hugh Jackman in Oklahoma. I mean, you just ask for it, and YouTube picks it up. I love it. And yeah. what about um, something, what about things like The Crown that are, are giving us this uh, new perspective on people who are all, who are still living. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, people who are still living. Well, I, I think mean, it's interesting. Historic... Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, if it's well done, if it's not boring, if it's not stupid and boring, you know, and, and, and they miscast it or they cast it too young, you know, if it's not a bad film, I mean, I'm all for it. I mean, living people are fascinating and uh, living situations that we're going through right now. I mean, who's going to play Trump? Who's going to play Trump? <laughs> I don't know who is going to play Trump. <laughs> yeah, but it's got to be a movie. I'd like it to be a musical. You know, they could do hairspray. <laughs> Why can't they do this one? <laughs> oh, my but, uh, God. Anyway, uh, mm -hmm. Who, yeah, who but, would uh, play Trump? <laughs> what's that? Who would play Trump? Well, I think there's some character actors out there who would do it. Uh, I'm sorry, Charles Durning isn't with us anymore. He would be good uh, at it, okay. but we'd have to get, you know, there's so many great character players. There really are. And there, there's a huge amount of people who would love to do something like that. I mean, you know, you know you'd have Obama so in it and you'd have, you know, Biden in it and Harris. I mean, you have all these really, it'd be really great. It'd be a great movie. But there's so many good political movies. I just did a KGO thing on political movies. I mean, the great political movies too. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and it's, it's not a bad time. It's just, we can't go to theaters now. So drive-ins seem to be what everybody's doing right now or staying at home. And at home, there are a lot of things to watch. I'm telling you that you can find all kinds of things that are really good, really good. And so of the interviews that you've done, is there one or two that stands out like, ah, uh, this was the, this was a great person to interview, a great get mm -hmm. for you? Yeah. Yeah, there's been good ones and bad ones. Um, Kim Novak is one of my favorites. Oh. Uh, she's been in a number of my favorite films, and uh, she has lots to say. And she's kind of a shy, soft-spoken gal. She lives up in Oregon, and she is just wonderful. I interviewed her when she came back to town a couple years ago when they were reissuing Vertigo. And oh. uh, she was just so fascinating. And, you know, if you talk about sex in cinema, which is one of my favorite subjects. I really love talking about the moment she comes down the stairs in the movie Picnic, where she's the prettiest girl in time, comes down the stairs and does Moon Glow with William Holden, who's this drifter, and you must have been Moon Glow. And you don't see anything except the two of them doing this slow swing. It's so sexy. So she told me some behind the scenes things on that. Oh, fun. She's really having an affair with Holden, lucky Kim. You know, I mean, God darn, I get wow. Adam Sandler and she gets him, you know, that's not fair. Not fair. <laughs> not that I know. I didn't mean it that way. I meant that's who I get. And she gets William Holden. I don't know. It doesn't seem. Like but anyway, um, <laughs> she's oh a wonderful God. interview. There've been so many others, Paul Newman, Cary Grant, 
I mean, oh, these are people Paul. I was lucky enough to interview, uh, Gregory Pack, because I was around for it. I was around yeah. while they were still alive. Now, recently, Matt Damon is a very good interview. Uh, Matt Damon really talks, and Ben Affleck, both of those who happen to be friends, longtime friends and all that, won the Oscar together. Uh, they both are wonderful interviews. Affleck's one of my favorites ever, ever. He's so gutsy. You know, there's all this publicity about him and all this, but he is a gutsy, cool guy. Really? really? Mm -hmm. What do you think, what's going to happen to the Oscars? Uh, I'm very angry about the Oscars. I just did a show uh, also last night about the Oscars. I'm very upset. Uh, they're coming out in April. Yeah, and they're going to include this year. They're going to include Netflix. They're going to include things on the internet because we can't go to theaters. But they're having some real controversial issues now with inclusion, and I'm very against what they're doing, which is trying to get artists and filmmakers to conform. I mean, mm. what's so silly and ironic is this is happening anyway. We're, they've already changed the rules. Who, who's in the Academy now? It's already all full of inclusiveness. As I said, I've been the DGA, the Directors Guild of America for many, many years. Uh, everything's changing. Uh, who's behind the scenes? Who's in front of the scenes? The theme of movies is already changing, right? Mm -hmm. Look at last year. I mean, Parasite last year, 12 Years a Slave. I mean, so many things. But what I don't understand is... Uh, why they are additionally now trying to change the best picture requirements to even be oh. more restrictive. And I'm very upset about that. And I hope that the people at the Academy will fight back because you oh. don't tell Patty Chayefsky how to write. You don't tell, uh, you know, he wrote Network, which is one of my favorite movies ever. And wow. you don't tell, uh, you know, you don't tell Picasso how to paint and you don't tell Scorsese who to put in his movies. And mm -mm. So they better watch it. Interesting. Interesting. What, what do you think about going back to the movies? When are we going to go back? Uh, well, in terms of sitting together, like Cinema Paradiso, where we all sit together and we're all crying at Garbo and laughing at Chaplin or whatever, that's not going to happen for a long time, not till this pandemic is done. So in the yeah. meantime, we're doing drive-ins, people, which is mm -hmm. great for kids. If you have kids, uh, that is a great way to get them out and do drive-ins. Or otherwise, we stay at home and we look for things. Don't forget, uh -huh. we got to find our laughter. We can't forget how to laugh. You know, laughter is internal jogging, and you gotta you gotta <laughs> laugh. And so, find movies that make you laugh. I've got lists of them. Movies that make you laugh. You know, language that you film noir with that pithy, quick language. It's so interesting, like Double Indemnity. You know, yes, look for that. Yes. Yeah. Can you, that's a great idea. Can you? Can you give us, so we have My Favorite Year, which we barely touched on, which was so fun. Can you give us two more suggestions of things to lighten the mood? Well, uh, you know, in terms of what people should watch. Yeah, well, we like do that. You know, I really haven't finished talking about My Favorite Year, but I wanted to uh, just say that, uh, you know, maybe we could do this again and we can oh, we uh, do that. We will. Come up with some more. I want to mention with My Favorite Year, uh, that mm -hmm. Peter O'Toole had just made the movie The Stuntman. So this was his second movie in a row about show business in Hollywood. He played a crazy eccentric huh. director, egotistical director. Wait, is that redundant? Uh, in Stuntman. <laughs> and then he went and he did uh, My Favorite Year. Now, he, I believe he should have won an Oscar for My Favorite Year. I think he was that good. But guess what? And he was nominated for Stuntman, too. But guess what? It was the year of Gandhi. And how can you go uh, up against Mahatma Gandhi, Ben Kingsley, forget about yeah, it. Yeah. So, yeah. and that's what O'Toole told me. He said, how is I gonna go up against Gandhi? He said, hey, you know, whatever. Yeah, he's great. Uh, also, um, the producer um, in the movie is Adolph Green. He's the show's <gasps> producer. And he is actually in real life, uh, Betty Condon and Adolph Green wrote Singing in the Rain and The Bandwagon and mm -hmm. On the Town. So this was a very, this, you know, you're looking at heavy hitters when you look at it, uh, my favorite year. Really terrific. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. And, oh, and uh, Mel Brooks had a lot of input into the script because he went through it himself. And I, I just want to mention, uh, if you give yourself a Mel Brooks film festival, there's something. I mean, just give yourself History of the World Part One. A lot of you haven't seen it. And it's incredible. <laughs> or uh, it's really great. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, uh, you know, of course, I know many of you have seen Young Frankenstein or coming up to Halloween, but uh, see it again. See it again. 
I have lots of information. Cloris Leachman said to me, I did a whole evening with her in uh, the East Bay, actually, at a theater. And wow. she did, I'm trying to remember exactly where it was. I've done so much, I can't quite get there. Um, but um, there's, a, there's some really nice theaters in the East Bay. But yeah. um, anyway, so uh, uh, I interviewed Klaus Leachman and got some really good information about high anxiety and, you know, all of that. But anyway, there's Young Frankenstein, there's high anxiety, there's oh. every kind of Mel Brooks thing, Blazing Saddles again. See mm -hmm. how? I mean, that could never be made today. So, I know. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's a movie that made you love the movies, Catherine? Well, I loved, I went for Dead Poet Society when I was in ah. high school. I went there and we saw go. that six times in the movie theater and yeah. Star wow. Wars. What is it in that film that touched you like that? Um, I think it was... The, there was the character who wanted to act and wanted to be an actor more than anything. And I felt that back then for sure. I wanted to do that more than anything. Really? And yeah. And then being restricted by his, his dad, I didn't really have that experience, but I just, I, I, I related to that. And that, but what always got me was when they stood up for their teacher, captain, my yeah. captain. I just, wow. that, Good for that you. was the first First time I think I ugly you. cried as a kid oh. at a movie, and then it just—I it, I think the fact that it was so moving, I just—that's what I, yeah. you know, I wanted to keep it being. It tells moved. you a lot about yourself, you know. If you guys are at a dinner party or you're with other people or you're zooming, you know, in any kind of group, you can always do what's a movie that changed your life. I love leading yeah. discussions on that. Because everything everybody says to me, I get into why. Why was it that? Why did it touch you like that? You won't believe the things you hear. It's just fabulous. It's a great way to get to know who people are behind the facade. Do you have a screen. favorite movie? I have many favorites, but I just mentioned Network because I'm I'm thinking about it right now. And uh, But I'm also thinking about a movie called The Face in the Crowd, which is an Elia Kazan movie, uh, which introduced us to Andy Griffith. But don't think Sheriff of Mayberry. In this, he plays Lonesome Rhodes, who's a, a man who becomes mad. He becomes mad with power. He's a TV star. He becomes a TV star. He's first a radio drifter, becomes a TV star through a, a woman who produces uh, radio and then television. And he becomes a star. And he starts being able to tell politicians how to think. He huh. goes insane. He goes mad uh, with power. And it's about this egomaniacal uh, madness of power. And and uh, it's fantastic. It's called A Face in the Crowd. A or face. I'm thinking Network, uh, because Network is about what happens in television uh -huh. uh, when the entertainment division runs the news division. And yeah. suddenly we get all this gaslighting of what's real, what's not. Gaslight, I'll take gaslight. <laughs> I'll take <laughs> gaslight for 10,000, Alex. Uh, <laughs> gaslight. <laughs> gaslight um, is really great with Ingrid Bergman and, and Charles Boyer and Joseph Cotton and Angela Lansbury. Really, really good. Because so, it's about something that matters. It's about right. a man dri driving his wife insane by telling her things and she hears them enough, she believes them and she's being gaslit. It's it's fantastic. And now it's part of the lexicon. I know, that's so crazy. Mm -hmm. Oh, see, this is my husband, by the way. He's saying, uh, history, of, history of the world part one is one of his favorites. <laughs> Good for him. Yeah. Good for him, the Inquisition. Let's begin. Yeah, I'm there with him. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. It's a really good one. And so don't forget good. at the end, he, they have promos for History of World Part II, and it's Hitler on ice. <laughs> and you have this ice capades with Hitler. It's definitely unusual. It's good, and it's good to be king. That's from History of the World Part One. Mm -hmm. It's good to be king. Really good. It's good to be the king. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Jan, I, I feel... Mm -hmm. Like I could, we should probably keep we could go forever. We'll do it again. We'll do the sequel. Let's do the sequel. sequel, and then we'll have a sequel to the sequel. Hopefully, oh my! Right, and but, people can send you questions. I like yeah. answering questions. I love answering okay. questions. I'm always asking the questions. It's nice for someone to ask me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Don't forget, I have if I was a ranch, if I was a ranch, I'd be the barn nothing. That's <laughs> a line from Gilda, but I like it for myself. <laughs> 
Oh, I love it. I just, I have so enjoyed getting to know you just as, just Thank this you, little Catherine. bit much. And, and please well. come back Great to know you us. and your people out there. Yeah. Come back and see us and we'll, uh, I will, we'll be in touch soon to make this happen again, for sure. Okay, Catherine. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Everybody stay healthy, stay well, stay happy. You Bye too, Jan. Thank, thank you. <laughs> And for the rest of you, thank you so much for being here today. What a delight and just a just a, a, a scintillating reminder of how important um, movies are and how important we are for each other to just keep it real and and enjoy enjoy good stories and and that there's so much out there. So I hope you feel as inspired as I do right now. And I hope that you'll dig deep and stick with us. And hopefully we'll see you at the festival in a couple of days. And until then, stay safe, stay sane, and stay connected. Bye-bye.